ready for today's marathon class. So today I'm going to discuss few of these dermatological cases and I've tried to make some charts so that for your re easy recall. So anywhere, if you have any problem, you are free to ask me. Okay. So okay, ma'am. Yes. So the first case, a 30-year-old lady attends a dermatology clinic with congruously reticulated violaceous patches, which become more distinguishable in cold weather, involving both lower limb. She has a history of SLE. So which one of the following is the most anticipated diagnosis? So going back again, she is a middle-aged woman. Uh, she has this reticulated violaceous patches, which become worse in cold weather, and she has SLE. So the anticipated diagnosis, I hope you can understand, it is re libido reticularis. Now, libido reticularis is thought to be due to spasms of the blood vessels or the problem of the blood flow near the skin surface. And it makes the skin look speckled or sort of a nate like pattern. And usually the lesions are present on legs, arms, trunk, and it's most distinct during the cold weather. And there's another rare condition, libido resmosa, which I will talk shortly. And libido reticularis is usually associated with malignancy, vasculitis, SLE, cholesterol embolism, and drugs like amantidine and norepinephrine. So if you look into this picture, the skin vasculature usually supplies in a cone-shaped fashion. So this is the apex of the arteriole. And when there's vasospasm, there's relative pallor in the center. And the venous plexus takes over, giving rise to this levidoid appearance. And in extreme cases, you can develop this ulceration. So whenever you come across levidoid appearance, first check whether it's associated with systemic disease or no. If it is no, and if the course is persistent, then you think of idiopathic libido reticularis, where there's no underlying cause. And if it has a fluctuating course, whether it's primary libido reticularis or it is physiologic, as we see in you know, chill infants, it is known as cutis marmorata. Now, if there's any systemic association, we call it secondary libido. And the causes I just mentioned, it, you have to evaluate for embolic event, hypercoagulable state, uh, hematologic disease, infectious disease, endocrine disease, connective tissue disease, and ma malignancy. And of course, last but not the least, medications. And libido resmosa is a condition where this libido network is incomplete. Here you can see in libido reticulates, it's a complete network. Whereas in libido resmosa, it's incomplete. And it's always secondary and strongly associated with antiphospholipid syndrome. Usually the lesions are present mostly on the trunk and they're painful, they're quite persistent. And Whenever this libido resmosa is present, we have to look for systemic causes. So the treatment of libido, libido reticulis is according to the cause. I'll just go back to the first slide. The other options which were given was erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum usually presents as painful nodules, mostly over the low leg. Pyoderma gangrenosum, which is again an ulcer. I'll show you some picture. Erythema ab igni usually occurs because of chronic exposure to, oh, you know, in, sitting in front of the fire, chronic exposure to heat, and erythema marginatum that occurs with rheumatic fever. So here you can see erythema nodosum, painful lesions lower, over lower leg. There is another case of erythema nodosum I will discuss. Pyoderma gangrenosum is a non-healing ulcer. The patient, uh, of course, this patient didn't have any of them. Libido reticulis can be confused with erythema ab agni, but erythema ab agni usually occurs in one part of the uh, you know, um, body. It's not universal as in libido reticulis. Wherever there's heat exposure, there is chronic changes, there's pigmentary changes that gives rise to this appearance. And of course, this erythema ab agni, you must remember that it's associated with Kangri's also. And erythema marginatum, you can see articular lesions, but they are not very, you know, irregular. So this is associated with rheumatic fever. So the next patient is a 31-year-old gentleman who presents to the emergency department with a two-month history of hematemesis, abdominal pain, and pyrexia. He subsequently admitted to the ward and found to be apyrexial and hemodynamically stable. On examination, there were numerous crusted linear lesions on his forearm. So what is the most anticipated diagnosis? 
whether it's an acute intermittent porphyria, factitious disorder, tuberculosis, granulomatosis with an polyangitis, or SLE. Now, acute intermittent porphyria usually doesn't have any skin lesion, so this is excluded. Factitious disorder, you can see numerous encrusted linear lesions on his forearm. A patient who is having some endogenous disease, why the lesions will be only limited to the forearm? So that is that should raise your doubt. Tuberculosis, yes, patients with history of fever, hematemesis, uh, tuberculosis definitely has to be ruled out, but tuberculosis should not be associated with this encrusted linear lesions because cuteness TB lesions look different. I will show you in a minute. And granulomatosis with polyangitis will again have other systemic symptoms and SLE definitely will have other features. Because the history is very vague and clinical examination had no features other than this linear rash. He was apyrexial and the fact that he was hemodynamically stable rules out prolonged hematemesis. So the linear lesions are rarely caused by organic disease, especially when the lesions are accessible, uh, you know, located over the accessible areas. Dermatitis active artifactor or factitious dermatitis is usually a psychocuteness disease when the patient consciously create the lesions on their skin, hair or nails or mucosa in order to draw attention or to the evade responsibility. Dermatitis artifactor should enter the differential diagnosis of any chronic puzzling recurrent dermatosis, which does not fit with any other you know, uh, clinical features. Acute intermittent porphyria, as I said, is not associated with uh, you know, any uh, uh, skin lesions. It, usually it's an autodermal dominant disease characterized by uh, abdominal pain, psychiatric symptoms, and uh, neuropathy and seizures. So dermatitis, in fact, I've shown a few lesions over here. You can see linear lesions. The patients have scratched or they keep on you know, irritating or, or their skin. So they develop these well-defined prurigo lesions. And these are mostly on the accessible areas. So they usually have otherwise good health. Their personal history of chronic dermatosis. There is a personal or family history of psychiatric illness and personal history of chronic medical conditions, chronic pain syndromes or both. The management requires dermatologic and often psychiatric expertise. And of course, you must address other chronic dermatosis, other chronic medical conditions and psychosocial problems in order to treat these patients. Now, tuberculosis, as I said, from history of fever, hematemesis, uh, one can think of tuberculosis, but in this patient, they didn't uh, mention any risk factor of exposure. Early morning sputum and urine should be examined to help to exclude the diagnosis. A chest X-ray is also mandatory. And SLE patients can present in various ways. Again, I will show you a slide to show the cuteness features. And granulomatosis with polyangitis usually have lung symptoms. They can have eye inflammation of eyes. There will be snuffles. They can have uh, you know, skin lesions. So none of these are present in this patient. So just to show you this vascular, because we just uh, talked about uh, vasculitis, this is a nice picture which gives a good idea about vasculitis. When there's vasculitis of the large vessels, it, it is stachyosis or giant cell arthritis. Now, medium-sized vessel vasculitis, vasculitis is usually polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki's disease. And when this vasculitis, ANCA associated small vessel vasculitis, includes microscopic polyangitis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, that means vagueness disease, or Schuchter's disease, which can involve this uh, small vessels. Whereas uh, immune complex vasculitis usually occur in further smaller vessels, that is cryoglobulinic vasculitis, henoxalin purpura, hypocomplement articular vasculitis, they all affect the smaller uh, vessels. And anti glomerular basement membrane disease that is good pasture syndromes usually affect this capillary area so it will be help, it will be helpful for you to remember about vasculitis now sle there are four cuteness features of sle in the eular icr criteria for classification of sle of which non scarring alopecia oral ulcers subcuteness or discoid uh, lupus 
subacute cuteness or discoid lupus lesions or acute cuteness lupus. None of these features were present in this patient. And cuteness tuberculosis can occur through exogenous root or through endogenous root. Exogenous root means there's inoculation as happens in tubercular chancre, tuberculosis varicosa cutis, and sometimes in lupus vulgaris. Whereas through endogenous root, the lesions usually we see are lupus vulgaris, scrofuloderma, miliary tuberculosis, artificial tuberculosis. So this is classic uh, you know, picture of lupus vulgaris. There's a scarring area, the lesions uh, progresses, and you can have apple jelly nodules on dioscopy. That is the classical description of lupus vulgaris. Whereas in scrofuloderma, usually there can be painless swelling of the skin. Sometimes it can ulcerate. And if you are lucky, as in this case, there can be underlying tubercular focus. And also tuberculosis can present as a hypersensitive reaction as happens in erythema nodosum. And in papulonecrotic tuberculosis, this is also a, a variety of hypersensitive response to tuberculosis infection. Now, this next patient is a 17-year-old girl who presents to her general practitioner being accompanied by her patient parents. Uh, she has recently returned from holiday from Mexico and her classmates are very uh, upset that the quality of her tan, she appears to have large depigmented areas on her skin, on her abdomen, on her back. And she says these areas are prickly. On examination, general physician confirms the depigmentation and there is a superficial scaling over these areas. So which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment for this girl? So the GP has confirmed that there's a depigmented area and there's superficial scaling. So whenever you see depigmentation, uh, you have to think of vitiligo and pityriasis, and versicolor or pityriasis alba, but her age, usually she won't have pityriasis alba. And especially when she's back from a holiday, uh, <coughs> where she had reasonable sun exposure and the areas didn't tan. So the most uh, possible diagnosis is pityriasis versicolor. So what will be the most appropriate initial treatment? Reassurance, oral antifungals, topical antifungals, oral steroids or topical steroids. Of course, pityriasis versicolor should, treatment should start with topical antifungals. So Pityriasis versicolor is caused by Malassezia far far, and usually it you know proliferates. This is a normal common cell in our body. It proliferates in hot weather, and it usually uh, present in the skin of the trunk, arm, or sometimes it spreads to uh, face as well. And areas of depigmentations are seen. Topical antifungals are treatment of choice, and uh, if the lesion is very severe, a systemic compound like fluconazole can be used. And pityriasis versicolor can be diagnosed through Woods lump examination where you see yellow orange bare fringes. And also often the questions are asked, where can you use wood lump? Wood lump examination can be done for vitiligo, melasma, fungal infection, and erythrasma. A 19-year-old sprinter presented to the dermatology clinic with multiple itchy scaly lesions on her legs and thighs. She states that she had similar lesions in the past which had been treated with some unspecified local medication. On examination, she was found to have multiple erythematous scaly plaques with a raised peripheral margin and clear center with hyperpigmentation. So which one will be the most anticipated diagnosis? Fixed drug eruption, sarcoidosis, psoriasis, allergic contact dermatitis, tinea corpus. Again, going back to the history, young sprinter, that means she's sweating a lot. She had multiple itchy scaly lesions, uh, which are, you know, ring-shaped lesions we can think of. And they have a raised peripheral margin with central clearing. So usually we see that kind of lesion with tinea corporis. Tinea corporis is a superficial fungal infection caused by dermatophytes. It's very common among athletes. And usually there is a central clearing and peripheral margins are active. The lesions typically itchy and it can increase in number over a period of time. And mostly the legs, thighs, trunk are involved. And it is a occupational dermatosis in athletes and may be recurrent in them if due precautions are not taken. Allergic contact dermatitis, because it's a dermatitis, it will 
have papulovesicular eruption, it will be very itchy. There can be oozing and <coughs> history will also be helpful. Fixed drug eruption we see on exposure to the same group of drug, every time the lesion becomes erythematous, the center is usually hyperpigmented and sometimes in extreme cases, there can be bulla formation. And in psoriasis, it's a papulosquamous disease with scaling and the scaling will be uniform, not on located on, on the margin. And sarcoidosis may present uh, in various form, but usually the clinical picture described is not safe. So in, this is fixed drug eruption. You can see a well-defined hyperpigmented lesion surrounded by erythema. Whenever the drug exposure happens, the lesion becomes active. Why this is called fixed drug eruption? Because at the same place, reactivation takes place. That's why it's called fixed drug eruption. In sarcoidosis, as I said, there can be papus, plugs, you know, there can be various kind of uh, lesions, but there will be some amount of infiltrations. So this is not the case in this patient. And in allergic contact dermatitis, they will present as dermatitic lesion, psoriasis, you all know, and tinea, you can see well-defined clear margin with central clearing. Now, topical antifungals, usually acrotrimazole, iconazole, myconazole, nystatin, ketoconazole, tarbinafin, thioconazole. These are the drugs used in United Kingdom. And among the oral antifungals, ketoconazole, itraconazole, fluconazole, tarbinafin, and grisofalvin. These are uh, usually used in United Kingdom. And for systemic infection, posiconazole, voriconazole, and amphotericin B can be used. Systemic uh, deep fungal infections, uh, let me tell you, they are different. So from these dermatophytes, you don't get systemic infection from these dermatophytes. They're only limited to the skin. A 45-year-old gentleman presents to the dermatologic clinic with red target lesions limited to both hands and he's diagnosed with erythema multiforme. So he's already diagnosed with erythema multiforme. Which one of the following could be the most likely cause of erythema multiforme. Ureaplasma urolyticum, penicillin V, Langhansel histiocytosis, COVID-19 infection, group B streptococcal infection. And I'm sure all of you know that erythema multiforme, penicillin is one of the commonest drugs which can cause erythema multiforme. So you have to look for the potential causes of erythema multiforme. So ureaplasma urolyticum is a non-gonococcal infection. Usually they don't have any skin symptoms. Langa and cell histocytosis can have various kind of uh, skin manifestation. I will tell you shortly. And COVID-19 infection, we have seen multiple maculopapular rash, articular rash, pseudo brains, but not, there have been one case of erythema multiforme, uh, you know, reported for COVID, but you, this is usually not the usual rash we see with COVID-19 infection. And group B streptococcus infection usually affects the skin and soft tissues and manifests as cellulitis, abscess, foot infection, decubitus ulcer, especially happens in moribund patients or in diabetics. Now, histiocytosis is a group of disorder where there's infiltration of histiocytes. And here you can have, when there's Langhans cell histiocytes, we call it L group. And among this L group, we have this Langhans cell histiocytosis, which we just mentioned. And Langhans cell, hist cell histocytosis can be three types, chronic unifocal, that is classic multifocal and disseminated Langhans cell histocytosis or later serious disease. This usually uh, affects the children, presents a seborrheic dermatitis like features. Then in C group, we have cutaneous non-LCH histocytosis. In M group is malignant group. R group is rosite Hoffman disease. And H group is primary and secondary HLH. So, histocytosis patients can have various kind of infiltrated nodules, small papular lesions, there can be various morphological features. So, these are the causes of erythema multiforme. It can be viral, bacterial, um, it can be drug induced, there can be immune related, it can be food chemicals can be responsible. But the commonest cause of erythema multiforme is herpes virus infection. And among the bacteria, mycoplasma pneumonia is another common cause to cause erythema multiforme. So we can all go through this list later on.
Now, a 21-year-old gentleman presents to his general practitioner with two-week history of red tender lumps on his shins and arthralgia. His chest X-ray shows bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy and clear lung fields. A clinical diagnosis of psychosis is made. 